Um, when airspace was closed below 3,000 feet, and journalists were not allowed to take pictures of the approaching oil sheen. Not to be stopped, activists joined up with local fishermen and improvised with large kites on really long strings and really cheap cameras to take their own aerial images. So from this boat that we're seeing, uh, we were able to capture two centimeter resolution of terns and uh, seagulls on these sandbars alongside with oil sheen, uh, chemical dispersant, and tarballs. And these images went out around the world over CNN. They were produced by citizens before the government had released any data at all. And all of these 8,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels resolution fit into one single pixel of the daily Lotus satellite imagery. This, uh, a week later, was released by the government, low resolution, and summarized with simple vector lines that were meant to indicate the extent of oil along a shoreline. You can see in, in citizen collected imagery that, in fact, the shoreline was heavily oiled, and also that the boom, this is the white absorbent Q-tip looking stuff in the water, was failing to absorb the oil. And that was a piece of information that hadn't gone out before. To manage all these aerial photographs and turn them into maps, we wrote some collaborative software called MapNitter, where you can just upload your aerial photos on top of existing imagery and stretch it and position it to make a map. Hit export, and we'll create authoritative geographic formats that can be overlaid with government data. These maps are now being made around the world. People are using them for advocacy to, their, to either their federal government, states, even to talk to their neighbors. Uh, we also distribute to Google Maps and Google Earth so that if you zoom in to an area where you've mapped, you'll see your own higher resolution and a credit to public laboratories so people can find who actually took those pictures, why they remapped a particular site of cartographic dispute. The data doesn't just stay online, though. We print it out into newsletters uh, called the Grassroots Mapping Forum, so we can distribute stacks of them to people who would otherwise not have access to online data sources. So this is an example of do-it-yourself aerial mapping. And this technique we have replicated again and again for indoor air quality mapping, spectroscopy, infrared imaging, thermal photography following this simple model, which is low-cost hardware plus collaborative web software, um, a visual data format, and a public archive. In addition, we have some simple principles that I'd like to share with you that I think would be relevant for um, our very geeky audience, because more complicated is not always better. So, the first principle is that locals decide what to research. The importance of this, when we're talking about, uh, you may have heard the phrases crowdsourcing or citizen science. In many cases, these are people, these professional scientists are asking people to contribute their own information and their own research to a bigger question that someone else asked. And in public lab, we seek to empower people to answer their own questions. Not all equipment has to start with soldering on a circuit board. You can do a lot with grabbing an old digital camera and either changing a filter, hoisting it 1,000 feet in the air, or putting a diffraction grating in front of the lens. You can take high quality consumer goods that are not that expensive, stuff from five years ago, and turn it into research equipment. Whatever you customize it with can be adjusted to whatever you can source locally. We tend to put our cameras in soda bottles so that when they crash land, they don't break. But whatever kind of bottle you have, whatever, whatever kind of line you have, it doesn't matter. You can replace 100% of the materials in our kits and they'll still work. So we kind of have a problem with spreadsheets, um, numbers that aren't immediately legible 
Like, what do all these numbers mean? We, we emphasize raster data that conveys information um, just by looking at it, even if you don't already understand um, the exact format. For instance, this is a cold window and a hot cup of coffee. Along our tool designs, um, and yes, this is a bit of a dig at drones. Yes, they're fine, but um, you can't trace back to who's operating them. It's a, it's a feeling of surveillance versus um, public science. So we prefer balloons and kites, which have been time tested over millennia, and you can always follow that string back to the hand of the person who's flying it and ask them why they're doing it. We believe in hands-on making throughout, throughout the whole process, not only to make the tool and understand how it works, but also to understand what kind of data, to actually specify what kind of data is needed to answer your question, and then have the, the know-how to put your political will behind the data and advocate to solve your question. Showing an example again of our data in Google Maps, we believe in mainstreaming true accountability so that uh, normally only industry or government can issue data, but by democratizing who has the ability to speak in these languages of power, uh, we can hold those institutions accountable. And all of this way of working, we protect with open source licenses from our hardware, documentation, and software. So, okay, in all this framework, what are people actually researching? Uh, coal terminals in Mississippi, dumping coal dust into the river. In this case, a local sheriff actually protected the right of someone to fly a kite from a public access bridge. <laughs> And this information is now being used um, to go to the State Department of Environmental Quality and pursue action against this operator. Locally, here in the Gowanus Canal, um, this is a shot of actually hordes of dying bacteria that bloomed and fed on sewage that was overflowing after Hurricane Sandy. Um, this is not merely a beautiful picture of a terrible environmental problem, the local activists, um, with their healthy sense of irony, actually used the opacity in the water to prove a point they had that fresh water was still flowing into the Gowanus. This, combined with some bacterial testing, has influenced the EPA to increase the size of their Superfund cleanup by an entire city block. So an entire city block of wetlands additionally added to Brooklyn as a result of these citizens' investigations. Same theory with aerial cameras, but this time modified with an infrared filter. Small farms and gardens are using this kind of imagery to analyze their crop health. Large commercial farms do this too, but this puts, for less than $100, this puts the power in the hands of small farmers to test their crops mid-season before they come up short in a harvest. Also, infrared imagery can help tell apart different species. This shot was taken uh, in New Hampshire. A group was trying to manage their pond from invasive species. It's hard to distinguish um, green from green, but in infrared, you can clearly see where the invasive species are and make a management plan. So in this case, people are not appealing to government to take action. They're collecting their own data for a very small feedback loop for their own self-management. This is our spectrometer. Uh, whether you have a phone or a webcam, you can put a filter in front of it to split light into uh, its representative wavelengths. And if you put a sample between the light and your phone, you can see what it's made out of. People did this um, for fun. You might try analyzing various white wines, as shown in this. Or you might want to uh, scan your laundry detergent and figure out which one is irritating your child's skin as this uh, researcher did. They found an invisible bluing agent in one of the organic, you know, free and clear dyes and were able to remove that and solve their child's problem. 
what we're working on now is fingerprinting oil so that we can, uh, and it, oil has a characteristic fluorescence. We're actually able to tell if uh, oil on your favorite beach came from crude oil dumped from a tanker or from our motor oil that was being washed downhill from your automotive repair shop. And in the classic fence line community example of people living literally right over the fence from toxic industries, uh, we're pioneering the use of a longer range spectrometer that can look at the gas flares, analyzing what color they are to see what chemicals are being burned off. This kind of action is often um, done by factories in the middle of the night where there are no regulators around and people suffer the ill health effects in their respiratory system. So this is starting to give people a way to address uh, industry behaving badly. So I've just talked about a lot of stuff and a lot of ways of making stuff. But I'd like to kind of contextualize and say that by the time we get to a kit, or a tool that you can pick up and use for research, that's absolutely the last stage of the process. It's like it's already solidified and, and dropped out of the stream. Or you could think of it as footprints from a parade of people who've already walked by. And I'd like to explain a little bit about how we collaborate so that new tools continue to get made. And we have, there are many, many prototypes coming from all corners. Public Lab grew from those five people you saw on a boat to over 5,000. Uh, the next order of magnitude is going to be harder, but we're well on our way. Um, we, let me explain a little bit on how our community works together. So our website is basically a field notebook that we all use. We all have profile pages. And we post what we do as a research note. Everything's attributed to your name, and by topic, you can sign up to ask or answer questions. So we have like a stack overflow built on top of essentially a, a field note notebook blogging platform. Everything that you contribute um, accrues by tool. So if someone picks up a spectrometer, uh, we, have, we send information with every single tool that lists who contributed to it. This is an important part of licensing that we learn from each other and the people upstream benefit from the new improvements that people downstream are making and the people downstream feel safe to jump into an existing project because they know that no one upstream is ever going to make it exclusive or charge a licensing fee. And there's a lot of talk. We have um, many mailing lists. I won't tell you exactly how many, because it's kind of scary. But the main group is called Public Laboratory, and we have one in English and one in Spanish. We have finer grain detail for our discussions. We break down by topic and also by place. And once a week, oh, sorry, once a month, we all get on the phone for open hour, which is actually something we stole from the tea party yeah, they had the idea to do a national call-in hour. So we do this. Um, just, we're just in um, serving Western Hemisphere time zones right now. Um, but we'll be expanding um, as we get more organizers um, in, the, uh, in other time zones. So organizers, let me explain a little bit about Public Lab. There's a very small nonprofit, less than 10 staff. And then, as I mentioned, there's 5,000 community members. And there's a layer in between of community-nominated leaders that are called organizers. Uh, we're 50 strong and growing. And this group of people actually sets the direction of Public Lab, writing our value statements, voting on uh, what public statements to make um, in the name of Public Lab. Um, deciding what research directions should be invested in. And organizers support their local chapters, of which there are many. Um, 
primarily uh, Western Hemisphere, but growing um, all the time. And all these people get together once a year. It's something called the barn raising. Um, it happens every fall, ideally after hurricane season in southern Louisiana. And people just work together. It's in the spirit of uh, community coming together to raise a structure that's bigger than any one person could do alone. We, it's unconference style. People decide what they want to talk about and when. This is Scott talking about tarballs. <clears throat> And uh, we're having our next one, November 13 through 16 this year. So I'll look that up. Something that came out of the barn raising was a, a concept called the barn star. And we picked this up from Wikipedia, who originally, I think, picked it up from Meatball Wiki. But it's kind of a warm, fuzzy sign of community appreciation. It's not a badge or certification. Anyone can award a barn star to anyone. The first one that got customized was um, to thank the people who fed the barn raisers. And then we quickly made a set that um, put, our, put values on open source documentation. So photo, video, film editing, and also publishing in that newsletter I mentioned, the Grassroots Mapping Forum. So barn stars sort of begin to take on uh, and embody the values that our community holds for itself. It's much less about saying who's an expert. Um, and then um, the Barn Stars are now you know, off and running. Um, that's Dawn, the Barn Star for excessive enthusiasm in the corner. But this is an ever-evolving way that our community defines itself. So taken together, um, Public Lab is seeking to make environmental research something that anyone can do in an age of big data, when government is essentially dictated by um, non-specific large data sets that define us, we're enabling people to step up and make their own statements and change the public debate. And actually, today was the climate march, and airspace was closed again. And this is just an example of how, um, in the case of Occupy Oakland, what a difference a day makes. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Um, OK, 5.30 PM on Sunday. <laughs> Who has questions? Can I help anyone connect to their local public lab chapters? There's around 200 folks here in New York, um, Boston, Philly, DC, um, New England in general, Gulf Coast, Chicago Midwest, and then Northern and Southern California. Anyone want to argue about drones? Maybe the definition of citizen science. They want to defend crowdsourcing and cyber science. That's fine. Yes, question. Um, no, if you go to publiclab.org and click join, you'll sign up for the website, and that'll auto subscribe you to the main list. Then you can check out, like, you'll see other lists get copied as various topics come up. Maybe you might find another one that you're interested in. Um, are you local? So I happen to be a staff person here. And if you need anything, liz at publiclab.org. Um, I can help you kind of onboard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we developed it. Um, I guess you're talking about MapMitter. Yeah, that's a lot of slides. Um, yeah, so with all the, for every bit of open hardware we make, we also write the software. So here we go. Yeah, so mapnitter.org, uh, we believe, is the only um, visual interface, interface to GDAL, which is running on our servers. So it makes it really easy for people to go from a picture on their camera to 
a tiled mapping service. <coughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so that's, that whole thing is called publiclab.org. The whole thing's on GitHub. We co-develop it with another open source community called FarmHack. And, and actually, um, between FarmHack and Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, we're trading, we're constantly trading ways to manage these hybrid online and offline communities. And so, not only are we developing new online features like this question and answer um, lid on an otherwise unmanageable wiki, um, but also like the format of open hours. Like, let's have a call in, just everyone get on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are working on water quality sensing, trying to make something, so we're as low tech as possible. So um, the current tool being developed um, up in the Boston area, working name of Riffle, is, the, is a dead simple conductivity meter that beeps faster if there are salts or heavy metals in the water. And why we're going with frequency and not using a data logger at all, is that if you're in a canoe, you can hear when you've crossed something that needs further investigation. Also, you can just send it you know, over, even if all you have is a flip phone, you can send that audio transmission and a computer somewhere else, anywhere, safely out of reach of being dropped into the water, um, can turn that into um, an archive, yeah. Uh, we're also working on the oil fingerprinting I mentioned, and then coming down the pipeline is uh, thermal photography. There's some work being done on thermal plumes coming out of nuclear power plants um, as a, a productive uh, leverage point when they seek to renew permits and we want them to have higher standards. Yeah. Okay guys, thanks so much. <laughs>